The text for the sermon this day is taken from the epistle lesson which you heard earlier. Grace, peace, and mercy to you from God our Father, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. As a Christian, you are blessed. You are blessed beyond all measure, beyond all understanding. Because you see, you were born dead in your sins and your trespasses. You were born an enemy of God. And though you, as though you were born in sin, you were not an unwilling participant in your sin. No one ever has to twist your arm. No one ever has to really push you to do it. You sin just fine all on your own. The whole, ad, whole adage, My devil, the devil made me do it, doesn't have to be so. Because you are just fine on your own, falling into sin. In the sight of God, on account of your sinful nature, you stood wretched. You stood reprehensible before God. You stood as an enemy of God. On account of your sin, the only destination in which you were worthy of was hell and damnation. That is the cost, consequence of those who have sin. And yet, though you were an enemy of God, though you stood opposed to him, our God did not choose the easy part. He did indeed send forth his son, born of the virgin, born of Mary, in order to be nailed to a cross, to suffer an agonizing death, to shed his blood, that you may have eternal life. By his blood, by his wounds, you are healed. You have received eternal life by the blood of Christ, not on account of works, but by grace through faith, so that no one may boast. You are blessed. You have received grace upon grace. But here's the deal. There is only one way to that salvation, and that is through Christ. There is no alternative way, no alternative path. It is only by grace, through faith in Jesus, who is the Christ, that salvation is to be had. Which is why Paul writes these words. I am speaking the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience bears witness in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing anguish in my heart. For I could wish that I myself were accursed and cut off from Christ for the sake of my brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. They are Israelites, and to them belong the adoption, the glory, the covenants, the giving of the law, the worship, and the promises. To them belong the patriarchs, and from there, their race, according to the flesh, is the Christ who is God over all, blessed forever. Amen. But it is not as though the word has failed, word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. You know, there is a myth that goes around that Jews, by consequence of being Jewish, by blood, are automatically saved. The problem with that, if that were the truth, then why is Paul saying what he is saying? What is he willing to give up his own salvation for? It's because, indeed, not everyone who is born of Israel belongs to Israel. And see, this is a great tragedy that Paul is echoing is that even though they had, the nation of Israel, 
They are descendants of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, Aaron, David, Solomon. All the writings of the prophets, the poet, the songs, the law, all of it was written by their ancestors. They are the ones who, their ancestors, their forefathers are the ones who wrote down the words that prophesied the coming of the Christ. And yet, when Jesus of Nazareth appeared and he, he fulfilled all of those prophecies, many rejected him. And because they rejected him as the Christ, they, were no, they did not belong to Israel because they had rejected the source of salvation. Paul is writing, by the way, the, church, the letter that he's writing, he's writing it to Jewish Christians in Rome. So indeed, there are many Jews who did believe that Jesus is the Christ. And indeed, they still belong to Israel. But there are many who stood apart. It is for them that he expresses this anguish. It is for them that he says that he would be willing to give up his own salvation if it meant them coming to Christ. Now, we live in a different world. We don't have a lot of Jews living amongst us. There's, there are some here and there, but not a lot. But the reality is, is we do live in a similar setting. Very, very many have grown up, and they have, heard, they have grown up in a, in a nation that is predominantly Christian, has... And so with churches on virtually every corner, many even have grown up in a church and yet stand apart from Christ. According to estimates, it will not be long before the largest religious group in the United States will be the religious nuns. And I mean N-O-N-E, not N-U-N. In other words, the atheists, the agnostics, and the religiously apathetic. They already outnumber Catholicism. And Catholic Church being the largest church body in Christianity, I guarantee it dwarfs us. Over 25% of Americans are non-religious. And it is the fastest growing group in the country by a long shot. There are so many that walk in our... So that means, by the way, if you see four random Americans, one of them is opposed to Christ, opposed to religion altogether. And that doesn't even account for the other religions such as Islam, which is indeed growing. Doesn't account for Buddhism, Hinduism, any number of New Age religions such as Wicca that are so prominent in our nation. All of them stand apart from Christ. And that doesn't even account. And then there is also those. When Luther wrote in his small catechism, there's a part that's called the preface. Not many people read it. And probably doesn't help that our, the catechism that Concordia Publishing House puts out puts the preface in the back of the book. Preface means it's supposed to start at the beginning, but for some reason they tuck it away. And so very few people ever read it. If you have a catechism, which you should, go pull it out and read it. But at one point... Luther writes that if a person has not received the Lord's Supper at least four times in a year, it should be feared that they are not a Christian. Now, he's not talking about 
and abnormal situations, such as those who were in the Soviet Union who went over a de went several decades without receiving the Lord's Supper because of time periods of persecution. And they never had a pastor because the pastors kept on getting executed. Or it's not such as, though, such as extreme health situations. There are individuals who have such severe dementia that they're not even able to be communed. I'm not talking about something like that. I'm talking about normal situations. Or relatively normal. If somebody has not received the Lord's Supper at least four times in a year, Luther argues that it should be feared that they are not saved. And the reason is because Jesus says, as often as you drink this. When he uses those words often, he expects that you're going to take it often. We, could, we believe that we, we, we understand that we are sinners. And the Lord's Supper is a gift which Jesus bought with his shedding of his blood, the breaking of his body on the cross, and a refusal to receive it does not mean that you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, but it means it makes one wonder if there is any faith. Remember, Luther, remember what James wrote. You say that there is a God, good. So do the demons, and they shudder. There's a difference between believing that God exists. There's a difference between believing that Jesus is the Christ and having faith in him. Trusting that that is a good gift that he pay, laid down his life for you to receive. Did you know, if you were to look on average for our county, Ida County, only one in five are in church on a given Sunday, again, under normal circumstances? That means you go to, go to Zimmy's, Find five, well, granted, probably most of them probably are coming from church, but hypothetical situation. <laughs> if you find five random people, only one of them was in church. Now, granted, some, it's like every three or four weeks or whatever, but there are many, if you look on our own rolls, that have not been to church, five, six, there's some that... I haven't even been here since Pastor Salcido's been here. And he's been here since, what, 2009 or whatever? You are surrounded by those who are very similar situation to these people of whom Paul talks about. You are surrounded by those who are perishing. Even those, some of those that are not so obvious. And the question is, do you lament over it? Do you have a great sorrow and unceasing anguish in your heart to the degree that Paul did? So great that you would be willing to give up your own salvation so that all of them may have salvation instead of you. Do you have that deep of an anguish? See, this is consistent with the two greatest commandments. What are the two greatest commandments? Not first and second commandment, but love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with all your strength. The second one is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. When you keep both of those commandments you are going to speak words of your Lord. You are going to be a witness of the gospel to your neighbor. He is going to be at the tip of your tongue. He is going to be at the center of your being. And the reality is, is that you and myself 
we fail. We are surrounded by those whom God has placed us in this world for the purpose of proclaiming his gospel to them. And yet, our love is not quite there. We keep our tongue silent. We don't talk about it lest we offend someone. And if I were to go by social media, I'd say the thing that we are most afraid of being offensive about is our faith. And I actually studied it throughout the week. Based on my social media wall, 30 to 50% of my posts are based, are, has something to do with politics. So you're not supposed to talk, talk about religion and politics? Social media, it's free game. Christ? Sometimes it reaches 6%. More often than not, it's zero. We are ashamed of, we don't even think to speak his name, even on social media. You're behind the safety of your screen. Do we have that same anguish? Or you realize that we would love to have another service so we can have more communion. Guess what? Are you willing to step up to help to do that, make that possible? We need people to run tech. We need people to usher. Are you willing to be that volunteer? Because being sorrowful, being in anguish is not merely complaining. It means taking action, stepping up, volunteering. There are many places, many ways that we are called to be witnesses. And there's many ways that we fail. And still our God, in the midst of our failure, because he is an awesome God, gracious and merciful, slow to an anger and abounding in steadfast love, he calls us to his throne of grace. And again and again, He forgives you. Again and again, he renews your heart. And you'll notice in the prayer that we usually pray right after the Lord's Supper, and I'm not sure if we're using the same prayer today or not, but we usually say that we pray that he would move us in fervent love for one another. We come to the supper and we give thanks that he has refreshed us through the salutary gift. We give thanks that we have been forgiven. And yes, indeed, as you receive it, you receive forgiveness. And by it, he strengthens you and enables you to serve him where he has. And it's grace, you'll never outrun it. You will never sin too much for him. He he has forgiven you for more than you will ever commit. So we turn again and again to the one who shed his blood for us. And as we receive that mercy, we turn and deliver it unto our neighbor. In Jesus' name, amen. The grace, peace, and mercy of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, keep you in the one true faith and the life everlasting.